Hello everyone, I hope you all are doing well. Throughout the last several weeks, various media outlets and content creators have dealt with an ever-changing and increasingly disturbing news cycle thanks to the war in Ukraine. Whether it's legacy media like CNN or MSNBC or freelance journalists, everyone in modern media has had to deal with the reality of wartime coverage. But another media world has had to deal with that same reality in its own way. This world of independent streamers and online pundits has taken on a new life as the war in Ukraine has unfolded. Through their various perspectives and outlooks, these pundits and streamers have dealt with the war in their own way, some good and controlled, and others not so much. But among these pundits, one has stuck out as particularly apologetic for Russia's involvement in Ukraine, Eddie Liger-Smith. For those unfamiliar with Eddie and his content, he's one of the main hosts of the Midwestern Marks YouTube channel and an occasional author on the Midwestern Marks website, along with several other writers. Over the last several months, he's released a series of videos on Russia and Ukraine from the beginning of the war's buildup to its eventual current state. Like Hassan, he's let his distrust of American intelligence blind him to the clear and present danger that Russia's hypernationalism posed, and through that distrust, he has continued to throw away his credibility through evasion, obfuscation, and blatant apologia. Through his content, Eddie follows a consistent pattern that renders his analysis inaccurate, and despite his objections, his work unwittingly lends itself to the Russian cause of war. Earlier this year, Eddie, like many lefties, didn't believe that the Russians would invade Ukraine. In his first video, titled Russia, Ukraine, and U.S. Imperialism, Eddie argued that the Russian government was not going to invade because they were moving troops within their own borders and that the media was just trying to manufacture a conflict. Many people have asked for a video about the ongoing situation between Ukraine, Russia, the U.S., and other NATO countries. Western mainstream media outlets are saying that Russia is increasing aggression towards Ukraine and may invade at any time, which could prompt the US to come to Ukraine's defense. Russian aggression was the justification used by Joe Biden and the US State Department for increasing weapons and arms shipments to Eastern Europe. Biden even floated the idea of having NATO countries send 50,000 troops, tanks, missiles, and aircrafts to threaten Russia. Here's an article from the corporate-owned Washington Post which says Russia moves troops and the US sends weapons to Ukraine in response. What this article leaves out, in my opinion, is that Russia is only moving their troops within their own borders. Because of course, Russia and Ukraine share a border. So as the US funnels weapons and threatens to send troops into Ukraine, Russia is preparing themselves and moving their troops along this border. When I first saw this video, I couldn't help but feel it foreshadowed something concerning, something I had seen in other left-wing creators before. Eddie's self-explained distrust of the intelligence community led him to believe that an invasion wouldn't occur. And that distrust alone would be excusable if it weren't for the way he handles media reporting. Keen-eyed viewers may have noticed how Eddie presents his sources and modern media. Namely, that he creates a division between traditional press and the Midwestern Marks articles that he presents. He does this by partially showing the headlines to the articles he cites, labeling them as some sort of corporate press in order to cast doubt on their reporting. With that out of the way, Eddie can present outlets like the Washington Post as if they are omitting key information from the stories he cites. For example, he presents this story, Russia moves troops and US sends weapons as fear of war mounts in Ukraine as an example of these omissions. Eddie claims that the Post and other outlets didn't mention that the Russian forces were operating in their own territory. There's just one problem. He didn't read it. Or scroll down. If you read the actual article, you can see that it never claimed Russia was moving troops into Ukraine, and they did mention that the Russian troops are in their own borders, at least at the time. And it wasn't like this was a hard thing to find in the article. It was within the first three paragraphs. You could have gone down within less than a minute and found the information you were looking for. And that's part of the issue with how Eddie portrays media. The narrative he spins or creates is part of this idea that the media is lying to you. And in doing so, he can ignore other issues involving countries' movements and motivations that don't just demonize the United States. And this is on perfect display with the Financial Times article he pointed to in that same video. If Eddie had read some of it, he would have noticed how it argued that Russian officials, such as Vladimir Putin, fear democratic norms and prefer to establish their own traditionalist norms in government. Now you can argue over whether or not the U.S. should be the one to address that, but to avoid discussing it altogether and treating it as though the U.S. is the singular problem in this conflict ignores the intentions of other countries like Russia. And this is precisely why Eddie failed to see the potential danger in the Russian troop deployments. 
Had Eddie ever shown or even looked at the Washington Post map, he would have noticed the positions that Russian troops were originally deployed in. He would have seen that they had clear targets in mind. It should go without saying that this map shows that the Russian government was, to some extent, intent on encircling Ukrainian positions and taking large swaths of the country, as they are now trying to do. But instead, Eddie and others like him failed to consider the reality of the situation because they let their distrust and their paranoia guide them instead of critically examining the claims on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, I get why someone wouldn't want to trust major media outlets, but this is asinine. When you have clear evidence and clear examinations of facts by media outlets, you have to tackle those facts head on. Instead of making up large meta-narratives of what could be true or what intentions may exist, examining the case-by-case -case evidence is critical to being an informed commentator and an informed citizen when dealing with these conflicts. And Eddie, through his distrust, failed to do that. And it is this asinine approach that would eventually force Eddie to have to shift his framing as it became increasingly clear that his original position was not only wrong, but painfully wrong. After the invasion began, Eddie switched his tone, going out of his way to downplay the violation of Ukraine's territorial integrity in a later video he released on his Snapchat. I don't mean to get super political on you all, but I was reading this article from USA Today, and it doesn't even mention, like, why Russia in entered Ukraine. And it doesn't mention the historical development that led to this this intervention. And it just talks about Putin, you know, and, and you know, it's so typical of like liberal media. It's like we just focus on these great men of history, right? You know, so if Russia does something, you know, there's no political political and historical development that led to Russia doing this is just, you know, Putin did this. Putin did this, and here's what Biden said about it. You know, they focus on the great men of history rather than actually informing people about what's going on. It is worth noting that in the path of two videos, Eddie's position has changed from they will never invade and the media is lying to you to the media is not explaining why Russia is invading. And as if to obfuscate that reality, he points to NATO, seemingly forgetting that the government that took power in 2014 was hesitant about joining it. All right, so people ask me for an explanation. Basically, in the 90s, the U.S. promised to stop expanding NATO, which is like this military agreement between the U.S. and other European countries. So this was after the fall of the Soviet Union, and Russia was like, you have to stop expanding NATO towards us. The U.S. did not stop expanding NATO, and now recently the U.S. has wanted to add Ukraine to NATO, and Ukraine has wanted to be added to NATO. And Russia said, no, you know, you're going to use Ukraine once they become part of NATO to launch interventions, uh, you know, like regime change efforts into Russia. So we don't want this, but the U.S. has wanted Ukraine to be part of NATO. It's been this big thing. Eddie then moves from blaming NATO to yet another claim that distracts from the illegal war that he failed to predict, falsely claiming that Donetsk and Luhansk chose independence freely and that there was no interference by the Russian government. Basically, these two regions of Donbass recently voted to become independent republics as all this hostility was increasing between NATO and Russia. He reiterated much of these points after he released another video reacting to two videos by Caleb Maupin and Jackson Hinkle. During the video, he repeatedly claims that the inhabitants of Donetsk and Luhansk willingly separated from Ukraine to defend themselves from far-right ethnic violence. Acknowledging a Russian invasion into Ukraine, because here's the deal, folks, and you know, you're not going to see this in the mainstream press, but uh, let, me, let me just show you. This. Yeah, the, that's a good point by Jackson. Even the mainstream media at this point was not saying Russia invaded Ukraine. Kyle went ahead with that clickbait title because he knew it would get views. The U.S. media was saying stuff like uh, Russian troops pour into Ukraine, right? Russian troops enter uh, independent republics next to Ukraine, right? They weren't saying Russia invades Ukraine because they know that would just be a blatant lie, right? That there are these people in, in Donetsk and Luhansk who voted for their independence, who voted to become independent republics because they're fearing far-right ethno-nationalist violence, which the U.S. has been supporting in Ukraine since earlier than 2014.
the reality is much more complicated. While there were attempts to secede from Ukraine back in 2014, those attempts were far from transparent, and they certainly were not what Eddie presents them as. The 2014 referendum was so hastily done that it had a litany of errors that compromised its integrity. In some cases, pro-Ukrainian activists were beaten, assaulted, and chased away, preventing them from participating. Reports also showed that there were incidents where ballots were cast multiple times. Hell, their registration list was two years old and hadn't even been updated since then. Combining that with the fact that the ballots had no protective frills to prevent them from being opened means that this election really had no consistent standards that could be accepted by international law, much less in the courts of Ukraine. Even the voter turnout is a matter of contention. While in Donetsk, officials claim that 89% of the registered people voted, the Ukrainian ministry puts that number as low as 32%. In Luhansk, separatists claim that over 94% of the people voted for independence, but Ukraine's internal affairs ministry put that number as low as 20%. Not only that, but Ukrainian security forces released audio recordings which they claim show Russian paramilitary leader Alexander Barkashov encouraging separatists to rig the vote and claim overwhelming support. With such a complete lack of transparency, are we really going to pretend that Ukraine doesn't have a reason to be worried about this being part of an annexation plan? Let's not be so contrarian that we can't understand why a sovereign state might feel threatened by the last several years of territorial loss largely instigated by one power. Russia. And it's not like Putin and his allies aren't willing to make up things to justify intervention in that region. Putin has repeatedly claimed that the intervention in the region was necessary because of supposed genocide against ethnic Russians. And in that same video that I showed you, Eddie has made the exact same argument. Kind of personal, are you fearful of this conflict in Russia and Ukraine? I'm fearful for the people there. Like before, Ru before Donetsk and Luhansk um, declared their independence and became independent republics and got protection from Russia, I was really nervous that there was going to be basically a genocide or a massacre of Russian citizens in the area by these far-right forces, by the Azov Battalion or the U.S.-backed ethno-nationalist neo-Nazis. You know, I thought they were going to start massacring Russian people. But now, these areas have declared their independence and Russia is protecting them, which the U.S. has called an invasion. Um, but, you know, I'm happy that those people are now going to be protected and that people are now fleeing by the thousands into Russia um, from these regions, which is scary and, and which is sad. But, you know, I hope those people get out safe. And, you know, I, I hope the same for Ukraine. I hope uh, the people in Ukraine are able to kick out this U.S.-backed ethno-nationalist government and are able to, to move towards peace and towards mutual cooperation with, with their Russian neighbors. A lot of the time, Russian pundits point to the shelling of residential areas in the Donbass, which, mind you, did happen, but did not represent an intent to commit genocide or as evidence of an attack on ethnic Russians to exterminate them. But if we are going to look for evidence of genocide, we could expect to see civilian casualties continuing from 2014 onward. After all, the Russian invasion occurred in 2022, meaning that if there was evidence of genocide and it was so severe, we would expect to see civilian casualties continuing up to the point of the invasion. Instead, civilian deaths in the Donbass have decreased since their peak in 2014. If Russia intended to engage in a peacekeeping mission, why did they wait until years after civilian deaths peaked? Why wait for a time when civilian casualties are at the lowest ever? And this failure to base the claims in statistical evidence is not new. Nor is it the first time that Eddie has claimed that ethnic violence justified the separatist movements in Donbass. Um, they were worried that they were going to be killed and there have been 14,000 Russians killed by ethno-nationalist violence in this region. So Russia came into this region and basically occupied it and said, we're done, you know, we're done um, allowing our people to be killed by this violence uh, or by this ethno-nationalist ethno violence. And if, if the U.S. keeps going and if Ukraine keeps going, we're going to invade Kiev. Like we're going to invade the capital of Ukraine. We're going to take Ukraine because Ukraine really shouldn't even be a nation anyways. That's what Putin said. Um, so, you know. Um, bad all around, but uh, hopefully things end peacefully, and I don't think this will lead to World War III.
While there has certainly been violence in Donbass, with many people killed, the amount of Russians killed in Donbass is not 14,000. Even Russian state media outlets acknowledge that this number includes Ukrainian security forces and Russian separatists. Other organizations have given more detailed and nuanced examinations of these numbers. The United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights found that between 2014 and 2021, between 14,200 and 14,400 people were killed of which 3,404 were civilians, 4,400 were Ukrainian forces, and an estimated 6,500 members of other armed groups. These numbers also include suicides, dangerous weapons and equipment usage, and road accidents, so these deaths are not all intentional. Even if we include injuries, the estimates don't support the claim that Ukraine was attempting to butcher the Russian people. Between 2014 and 2021, an estimated 37,000 to 39,000 people were injured in the Donbass region. According to that same source, the injuries included a maximum of 9,000 civilians, 14,200 Ukrainian forces, and 16,200 members of other armed groups. For once, civilians were not the majority of the victims in the war in Donbass, though considering the Russian forces' attempts to bomb Ukrainian civilians with seemingly no concern about the rules of war, that has changed in an obvious and brutal way. And that's not even mentioning the litany of crimes that are now being alleged in Bukha. And while I am certain Eddie would consider these deaths horrific, the argument will always go back to claims of Western imperialism, while ignoring how those claims are nothing more than a cover for the Russian government. With that out of the way, let's turn to perhaps one of the most frustrating arguments presented by Eddie Liger Smith and his cohorts, namely the argument that Ukraine is run by neo-Nazis and that the Ukrainian government is a Nazi government. And what we have seen are attacks against Russian people by these anti-Russian uh, extremists, the U.S.-backed anti-Russian extremists like the Azov Battalion. And we've seen them tearing down World War II memorials. They have been tearing down World War II memorials because they are actual neo-Nazis. They are actual neo-Nazis being uh, propped up by the United States to destabilize this region. And all these social Democrats, all these people who claim to just hate Nazis like Kyle Kalinske, are going along with it. Going along with the U.S. NATO narrative and the U.S. NATO-backed neo-Nazis. It's insane. As Russia and China are threatening U.S. unipolarity, threatening the U.S. as the dominant geopolitical hegemon, threatening the U.S. as the economic and military superpower in the world, and the U.S. hates that, NATO hates that, and they're increasingly trying to destabilize and attack these countries. So it's like you don't see, see that as suspicious at all, that the U.S. destabilized and did coups in these three former Soviet countries surrounding Russia, and now they're claiming that Russia is invading one of these countries as there's U.S.-backed far-right ethno-nationalist violence. Like This has clearly been manufactured by NATO and the U.S., all these conflicts. All these, um, or this Russian invasion of these places who declared themselves independent republics to free themselves from extremist far-right violence. It should go without saying that Nazis do not run Ukraine, but the argument has been promoted for a while now. The claim is largely based on the presence of the Azov Battalion and other far-right elements in the Ukrainian National Guard, which Azov joined in 2014. Many times, opponents of the Ukrainian government will point to the leadership of Petro Poroshenko, but rarely acknowledge how Ukraine's politics have changed since then. When talking about Nazis in Ukraine, pro-Putin advocates point to the Azov Battalion and Bandera specifically. While Ukraine has a complicated and sometimes disturbing history with these groups, they are not representative of the larger Ukrainian state nor are they representative of the Ukrainian people as a whole. In terms of its place prior to the invasion, Ukraine had an estimated 170,000 active duty troops, including 100,000 reservists and territorial defense forces that included at least 100,000 veterans as of March 3rd, according to the New York Times. By contrast, the Azov Battalion ranks between 900 and 2,500 soldiers before the invasion. It's also worth noting that the 900 estimate was taken more recently, whereas the 2500 was a older estimate. Even the National Militia, a national association of the regiment, ranks in the low thousands and is not representative of the larger military structure. On the political side, the Azov Battalion and its affiliates have had little success in gaining public office. In the 2019 election, organizations such as the National Corps, the Right Sector, and others failed to gain a single seat in the Ukrainian parliament. The idea that Nazis run Ukraine is entirely incorrect, 
Even Petro Poroshenko, one of the main reasons why these battalions were initiated into the Ukrainian military in the first place, lost his position to current President Volodymyr Zelensky, who won over 70% of the vote. If the argument is that Nazism has consumed the Ukrainian people, it wouldn't make much sense for the closest thing to Nazis in the political system to lose on such a grand scale and be replaced by an entirely new political figure. Also, it is completely hypocritical to point to the Ukrainian government and call out supposed Nazism while simultaneously failing to mention the role Putin and his allies have played in the rise of the global far right. It is especially damning that Eddie doesn't mention the Wagner Group, a far right neo-Nazi organization founded by Dmitry Utkin, who, despite working on behalf of the supposedly Nazi-hating Putin, has SS tattoos on his neck. Th that same Wagner group has also been deployed in multiple countries like Mali, the Central African Republic, Syria, Libya, and Ukraine. They've seized oil fields, mining sites, and many other facilities in the pursuit of Russian imperialism. And Putin's been shown taking pictures with Utkin, who helped support his empire. The idea that Russia is concerned about the far right is nothing more than a cover for Putin's illegal expansion into Ukraine. I don't mean to say that Ukraine has no problem with the far right. Figures like Stepan Bandera, a far right fascist and Nazi collaborator, have been praised and memorialized by some Ukrainians. But that doesn't justify an invasion, much less the idea that Ukraine is a Nazi state. If anything, Russia's invasion will increase Ukrainian national fervor and radicalization. If Eddie had even bothered to examine the evidence, he would have realized just how cruel and ridiculous the situation is, but he chose not to. As millions flee their homes, and even more are stuck wondering if they will have a life to rebuild, these talking points help absolutely nobody. They don't protect Russian suffering from sanctions, they don't justify the invasion, and they certainly don't clear up Russia's position on the world stage. I have interviewed plenty of people thus far with views on Ukraine, many of whom agree and disagree about the proper response to this crisis and what caused it. But not one of them was as uncritical of Russia's positions as Eddie has been. I hope that with time that changes, but after all of this, I am not holding my breath.